Coming up on DTNS, how the FBI got some of Colonial Pipeline's money back. Google pauses its war on full URLs and how tech is helping Generation Z find its identity. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, June 11th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And your boy, back from the SMR podcast, Big Chris Ashley. What it do? <laughs> Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland Island and Peralta. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Uh, we were just having a, a good old conversation about movies and trailers and spoilers. If you want that wider conversation, get our other show, Good Day Internet. It includes this show in it. Just become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. NVIDIA announced it's acquiring the high-definition mapping startup DeepMap. NVIDIA intends to use DeepMap's mapping IP in its autonomous vehicle business called NVIDIA Drive, which will let the company scale worldwide map operations. A couple quick Windows things here. The 6.115 update to Apple's Boot Camp now includes support for Windows Precision Touchpad drivers. That includes single tap to click, lower right corner to right click, down motion to scroll up, and three or four finger gestures. So if you're a boot camp user, that's nice. Also means they're still, you know, updating boot camp. Microsoft uh, introduced Windows Precision Touchpad in 2013. So this has been a long time coming. In another Windows development, Microsoft has updated its lifecycle page for Windows 10 Home and Pro to indicate it will continue to support at least one Windows 10 semi-annual channel until October 14th, 2025. That's interesting because previously retirement dates were only given to the twice yearly releases of Windows 10, the updates. So having this overall date has fueled speculation that Microsoft might announce a replacement for Windows 10 in its June 24th announcement, which it has said will include Windows, quote, most significant updates of the past decade, decade, decade. McDonald's said Friday it's hired security consultants to investigate unauthorized access into its networks. Intruders accessed data from markets including South Korea, Taiwan, and the U.S., which included some employee and franchisee contact information, details about restaurants in the U.S., along with delivery customer info like name, phone, email, and address in South Korea and Taiwan. Some information on employees in South Africa and also in Russia may also have been accessed but no payment info appears to have been compromised. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. The Chinese ride-hailing giant Didi Shuxing filed for an initial public offering with plans to list on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. In its financial statements, Didi disclosed a $1.7 billion loss on $21.6 billion in revenue for 2020, with SoftBank owning a 21.5% stake in the company, followed by Uber, which owns 12.8%. The New York State Senate voted to pass on Digital Fair Repair Act, which, quote, requires OEMs to make available for purposes of diagnosis, maintenance, or repair to any independent repair provider on fair and reasonable terms, documentation, parts, and tools, inclusive of any updates to information or embedded software. The bill must now pass New York's assembly before the end of New York's legislative session on June 17th. Mm, getting closer and closer. All right, let's talk a little bit more about that Chrome browser, Sarah. What are they doing? Well, yeah, you might be you might like this or not like this, depending on who you are. Google released Chrome 91 this week, which ends the idea of only showing the domain name in the address bar of Chrome-based browsers. Now, you might remember years ago, Chrome stopped displaying the other stuff, the HTTP, in the address bar, although it's still there if you're going to copy the URL and then paste it somewhere else. So the information is there, but it strips it out when you're looking at it. Last year in Chrome 86, Google tr decided to try what Apple Safari was already doing, which is only show the domain name, but if you click into the address bar, then you see the whole thing. The idea is to help users identify when they might be being fooled with a confusing URL, for example, paypal.phishingsite.com. With the full URL, you might glance and see PayPal. But if you only see the domain name, which is actually phishingsite.com, you would know you're not actually at PayPal's website, or hopefully you would at least see it more quickly. Android Police noted that Google engineer Emily Stark wrote in the Chromium Project's bug tracker that the simplified domain experiment will be deleted from the code base. She said, this experiment didn't move relevant security metrics, so we're not going to launch it. Yeah, so I actually like the concept of it, and uh, I think these companies should be doing whatever it takes to continue to help uh, regular users understand when they're not 
uh, going to a website that they think they're going to. I oftentimes, if I'm not sure about an email, I'll right click on the link and paste it in a text document and scrutinize the URL to see mm -hmm. if it's, you know, if it's a little shady and, you know, regular users aren't going to do that. So it's kind of a bummer that uh, their metrics show that people aren't paying attention to it and aren't looking at it. But instead of just removing it, I don't know why they didn't do some type of uh, campaign to inform people about it and to, for folks to understand that they were doing this on purpose for their benefit. Yeah, I think that's the key, right? If you're the type of user who even knows what the address bar is, you know, who pays attention to it, who looks at it, you're probably the type of user who does what Chris does and right clicks on URLs and really looks and goes, wait a minute, that doesn't say PayPal. That says PayPal.phishing site. Like right. the, it, there's there's a selection bias there. The, the people who are likely to look in the URL bar are likely not to be fooled. It's It's not something that regular users look at. They just click on things. Right. Uh, like you were saying, Chris. So I'm not terribly surprised that they found out that this didn't make much of a difference. I, I, I sort of get the idea in principle. I used to be against it when they first started doing this sort of thing, like in Safari, because in, I'm like, no, I want to see the URL. But of course, yeah. you can go change settings and all that uh, if you really need it. But the fact of the matter is that that bar doesn't mean much to to most people. They just ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. I was with you when it. When it first rolled around, I was like, this is op oversimplification. What do they think? I can't handle the actual string. Uh, but <laughs> I, th I probably forgot about it in 24 hours. Don't it's not something I've me. thought about. Yeah. Yeah. I think I forgot because I turned it off, right? And I, I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess it I guess it actually still does that. I actually went, I, I use Firefox mostly these days, but I always have Chrome, you know, to kind of check stuff. I had to go in and sort of look at this and be like, what does it do? What does it not do? Oh, yeah, it does do those things. They don't bother me one way or another. Well, maybe so. they realize there's a short of, shortage of fake emails and uh, fake links going out, so they don't really need this anymore. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They've all gone away. Thank goodness. It, yeah, they, they fixed it. The internet's <laughs> fixed. I, I like this new positive outlook, Chris. Maybe that's it. Uh, hey, everybody wants to know uh, what happened to all those Bitcoins the Colonial Pipeline paid. And we found out earlier this week that they got some of them back. Wall Street Journal's David Uberti has a story about how the U.S. FBI was able to get some of Colonial Pipeline's $4.4 million dollars back from dark side. Uh, if you recall, Colonial Pipeline did pay 75 Bitcoins, about $4.4 million worth, on May 8th. Essentially, the public nature of the blockchain worked in the FBI's favor here. While the identity of a wallet's owner is anonymous, and that's usually what you hear about, oh, anonymous Bitcoin laundering money, the blockchain makes every transaction public, meaning you can know, any of us can know which wallet got money, even if you don't know who owns the wallet. Law enforcement agencies have been observing the blockchain closely, and because of that, even if they don't know exactly who owns which wallets, they've been able to develop a map of what addresses are used regularly by malicious actors. Because if people are paying ransoms, and a lot of people are paying ransoms, they sometimes pay them to the same wallet address multiple times. All right. So a special agent of the FBI watched the blockchain for 19 days to see what happened to the 75 Bitcoins that were paid by Colonial Pipeline. And they were transferred to like six different addresses on the first day. But because of the blockchain, you could figure out, okay, it went from that to that to that to that. On May 13th, DarkSide announced that some of its servers had been seized and 11.3 Bitcoins were coincidentally transferred that day into a consolidated wallet that holds about 108 Bitcoins. Those 11.3 Bitcoins are still sitting there. We didn't get confirmation from the FBI that they seized the servers, but according to court documents on May 27th, 63.7 Bitcoins were transferred to a wallet that the FBI had the private key for. They hadn't told anybody that they had the key, but they did. So they went and got a warrant and seized those coins, which sadly for Colonial Pipeline are now only worth $2.3 million. Law enforcement is watching to see if the remaining coins in that other wallet move out of that consolidated wallet. Uh, and if they go into a wallet that maybe they have the key for, they might be able to seize those too. So I, I like this story for a, a multitude of reasons. One, 
it's kind of nice when you see the stuff that there's somewhat of a happy ending. So that's just the basic of it. Two, uh, hopefully more companies start to engage the FBI and law enforcement when they have these type of situations because many of these companies don't even mention it, don't do a thing, they pay it, and they continue to enable these you know, this market of, you know, capturing data and charging Bitcoins to get it back. So, you know, if they see that the FBI can actually be successful in helping them, then maybe, they'll, you know, they can get in there a, a lot sooner and help prevent some of these things. But more importantly, uh, what I like is the fact that, hey, folks, understand that the FBI and other law enforcement agencies are up on these servers and on these blockchains and stuff like that. So if you think you're necessarily getting away with stuff you're probably not yeah i like yeah, i, like I, mean, the I counter guess narrative the, here go ahead sir i guess my only question is you know this is just you know is it doomsday all around is okay well if the fbi can do this and colonial pipeline got some money back well if i have bitcoin in a wallet somewhere you know is someone going to you know figure out how to you know I don't know, take advantage of a server that that is somehow representing me and get a key and take my money too. Yeah, sure. Uh, remember, though, that uh, they had to do a lot of work to get that private key. I mean, it's easy for us to say, yeah. and they had the key, but there's a lot of, lot of legwork behind getting that key. That's hard work, and it's not something most entities are going to be willing to spend the time and effort to get, especially from somebody like me, right? The other thing yeah. is they got a warrant. The FBI didn't just go do it. They went to a court and said, these Bitcoins went to these addresses from Colonial Pipeline. We've traced them. Judge, can you sign the warrant that we're allowed to go do this? This wasn't the FBI just going rogue out there taking Bitcoin. So, you yeah. you, you know, you want to have that safety. But yeah, it's a fair question. Like, could this happen to me? Probably not. It's it's too much effort, but it was worth it in a situation like this. And it, and it does show that, you know, we always hear about Bitcoin as being secretive, but it's not that secretive. And, you know, you don't need to have an encryption backdoor to be able to enforce stuff against it here. Yeah. Good to, re good to remember. All right. So this is a super interesting story. So Tech in Asia has a write-up in the newsletter about F1 Delta Time, a racing game that uses a blockchain to let players exchange in-game currency for one of three cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ether, or USDT. You can also trade game assets as NFTs. An NFT for a car was sold in 2019 for $111,000 worth of cryptocurrency. 5% of an in-game track was sold in 2020 for $222,000. F1 Delta Times is made by Hong Kong-based Animoca brands, which publish other blockchain-based games like The Sandbox. This is the new trend. Yeah, yeah, so this, got, yeah, put the blockchain in your game now. Yeah, and the, the thing about this, it's super interesting because these type of things have already existed. People have done this stuff before. It just doesn't exist in a in a way that people can uh, are readily able to take advantage of it. So what do I mean? Um, I play Destiny, okay, and uh, Destiny 2 currently. And every weekend they have a competitive uh, game mode that's enabled from Friday at uh, 1 o'clock till Tuesday at reset at uh, uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And essentially, it's very difficult. You have to win seven games in a row, seven matches in a row. You have fire teams of 3v3. Three three v three. And But the reward at the end is generally considered some of the best weapons in the game So and the, some of the best gear. So people really want this stuff but they're not good enough to get it. And uh, so what you will see regularly advertised is our folks that are like amazing gamers that will say, you know what, we can get you flawless. And they charge for their services. So this is outside of people just sitting on uh, and uh, streaming on YouTube and people watching their streams. This is actually them saying, no, no, we will uh, take you flawless. Uh, we will try as many times as it takes to get us there. You pay us. $50, $100, and, you know, we'll take the games. And these type of things happen all the time. Also, yeah, I, you, Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just real quick. You also have, you know, regular uh, content where folks just don't feel like taking the time to do the same mission 100, 200 times until they can get a weapon to drop because it's all, uh, you know, randomly generated. 
And so they will take the time and say, you know what? I'll do that for you. Pay me 50 bucks and I'll keep doing it until the, until the weapon drops. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And the headlines are all about like these people are making money gaming. My, my, my guess is that Animoca has some sort of mining arrangement on the other end so that the more you game, the more you're helping them create coins, which means that they can pay you them. Uh, that, that's just a guess. I don't know if it really works that way, but that's interesting. It's interesting to say you can take your in-game currency and change it out to cryptocurrency because that cryptocurrency can then become real dollars. But I find it more fascinating that they're using NFTs for the in-game items because, you know, a lot of people like to hate on NFTs. Like, what are you buying? You're buying nothing. It's just bragging rights. Here's something where, yes, it is a non-tangible item, but this NFT gets you a car, right? And and that that goes back to what you're talking about, Chris. Like that could be a huge advantage in the game. So you're you're paying for something that that is real. It may not be tangible, but it's real to your experience in the game. Right. And uh people should probably understand, you know, NFT, the term NFT non-fungible. Uh and uh, all it really means is that you have something that's not easy to get. You know, that you can't just replace it. You have ten dollars, yeah. you can trade it for ten singles. But if you have, you know, a rare picture, you can't just go get another rare picture. So that, that's all that means. Yeah, we, we have a whole uh, new episode out this week on Know a Little More uh, about the NFT if you want to get a little bit of a deep dive into it. Uh, but this is, this is going to be something you're going to hear about. Uh, so, so keep your ears open about, you know, people bringing blockchain into games, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, especially into online games like this. And I, I think this is something that, that might get even bigger from here on out. I also hey. think before we, sorry, before we move on, I, I think that the you, you hear things like a car was sold a couple of years ago for over $100,000 worth of cryptocurrency and people go, oh, wow. So it's like we're, you know, people who can, um, you know, win at an auction because they're so rich. It's like, it doesn't have to be that, that much money. That's just one extreme example of, of how right. much people want something like this. Yep. Yeah, that was a that was a really powerful car. Uh, hey, folks, uh, if you're listening to Daily Tech News Show on the free public feed, uh, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, you support us by hearing ads. But if you don't want to hear the ads, you can support us directly and cut out the middleman uh, by supporting us on Patreon. Get your own personal RSS feed supported directly by you. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. CNET's Aaron Carson has written a piece called How Gen Z Harnessed the Internet and Destroyed the Generation Wars, which focuses on how the younger generation, we often call them Gen Z, I'm saying them because I'm not <laughs> technically in that category, is struggling to do what pretty much every generation before Gen Z has also struggled to do, which is define itself. Who are we? What do we stand for? What's different in this case, the younger you are, is the scale at which the internet plays into the definition of you because Gen Z kids have never known a world without being online. Uh, that is that is just a reality. Whether you hang out online or not, it has always been there. Examples include countless TikTok videos about what's cool. Uh, if you're younger, you want to part your hair in the middle. A side part apparently is something that only millennials do or maybe even Gen X old people. Clothing is cool or uncool. Catchphrases go in and out of style. So this is basic trend stuff. You're saying, well, yeah, I mean, that's what every generation does, right? It's a little bit different, though, because uh, Gen Z is working with a whole different set of platforms to let everyone know who they are. Carson notes that back in the early 2000s, Microsoft researcher Dana Boyd described a concept called context collapse. And this is when a person's friends and family and coworkers and high school friends, anybody from various segments of their social life suddenly were all in one place. You can think of, you know, Facebook or MySpace before it or Friendster and how the convergence of all those other people ended up affecting your behavior and how you wanted to be seen. So today, building an online persona or a persona overall is a very, very common and popular way to broadcast to the world who you are and who you aren't. Uh, and I think who you aren't plays into this pretty heavily. And since humans want to naturally form groups, you know, and belong to something, this is just the same thing all over again, but on a much bigger scale. We're all three generation X here, right? Yeah. Yeah. I am. Okay. So, yeah. you know, take that, take that into account. 
uh, <laughs> we, we, we just learned Chugi not that long ago. I mean, ago. It, it's, it's the best one, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, best one. but I, I remember that the, the reason our, our, our generation is named Generation X is because Douglas Copeland wrote a book called Generation X named after the band Generation X, uh, about our generation. And what was amazing about that book was that someone had written a book about our generation because, it was really hard to get our voices noticed. You didn't, you had all baby boomers writing uh, all the articles, doing all the television about us. Uh, and so getting a book published about us with our actual perspective was huge. That's, I think, what Aaron Carson is identifying here is that Generation Z doesn't have to wait for somebody to sneak into the publishing industry and get something published. They, yeah. they can just go out and broadcast their message in a way that no other generation has been able to do. The previous generation isn't controlling the narrative about who they are because of technology. Yeah. I, first off, I'll say this again. I, I have never once in my life referred to myself or people in my age group as Generation X. It's just never happened. I, I've, I've never understood the need to categorize, you know, the group of people by the, you know, the time frame with they were they were born. You know, we always have those fun conversations. Oh, your music you listen to is trash, as I can't stand 99% of the rap songs that I hear today. However, I, I do get the idea that, you know, a lot of times uh, you have groups that are marginalized or Silence because the gatekeepers in whatever industry or whatever publishing portion are like, no, this is what you guys sound like, as opposed to allowing the actual voices to be able to put put that out there. But this happens far wider than just the generations, right? So a lot of groups are being able to take advantage of the internet uh, and be able to get their voices out there and uh, you know put and really kind of define this is what we are this is what's going on this is where we're at so it, you know it, it, it's an interesting uh, revelation but uh, man I, I just really can't stand those terms yeah I you know I never really thought about what generation I was I I know in the back of my head I mean I know when I was born right so it's like if I have any questions I could look it up uh, and there's, you know, a little bit of overlap of like, are you millennial? Are you Gen Z? Or then there's baby boomers and the whole thing. It's, and there is some like, okay, you can, some of it is stereotypical and overgeneralizing, but it's like, okay, that generation tends to maybe have this, this thing, you know, that, that makes more sense for this generation and doesn't have a lot to do with, you know, the, the younger folks. I also remember when millennials were the, you know, just graduated college kids that everyone was like, oh, they don't know anything. And it's like, now millennials are 40. I don't know when that happened. It happened really quickly, but I, you know, I, I blink and it's next year. But I think your point, Tom, of the narrative and who is spinning the narrative is really important because yeah, it was the, the, the story has always been, are the kids all right? Meaning, you know, are they going to are they going to be able to hold up our economy and are they, do they know enough to get jobs later? And it's always the older people who feel that they have more experience and wisdom and that sure there's some element of truth to that. It all, it's all it's very relative, but yeah. that was that was where the narrative was coming from because it was people in more more positions of power and wealth and and establishment. And now there's there's just so much more of the like oh wait what's cool what's the thing what's the shiny thing who has all the followers ah yeah and and so many young people are just participating in that yeah I, I, you guys both hit hit on important points which is the generation label doesn't work for everybody right but it, it does work in aggregate when you're talking about large groups and it usually only hits people dead center in the middle of that that aggregation right uh, which is why we always continually do it. And usually it's because of what you were saying where everybody's like, oh yeah, no, the music that I grew up with is way cooler than your kid's music. Or, you know, you you guys have all these weird slang words. Where is, what does that even mean? But we all were like that when we were young and, and we all get uh, more skeptical about it as we get older. That all repeats. I think what is different about this generation the, the kids in their 20s and, and late teens right now is that they're able to have a conversation about the identity of who they are in their age group in a way that 
nobody was able to do on that scale anyway, right? It, it happened yeah. in small yeah. groups, right, in, b before. And now, now it's happening nationwide. And it's very similar to all the same things we have with political processes and, and entertainment where the extreme voices dominate. You know, and right. most people are probably like you, Chris, where they're like, I don't, you know, I don't even think about myself as Gen Z, but there's a few loud voices out there going, you and your skinny jeans, get off my lawn. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, I remember giving my son uh, grief because he would come out of the house and I'm like, dude, you can barely breathe. Stop it. Go take those jeans <laughs> off. You know, he's like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. This is this is not it. But I never, but I knew it was part of their identity and what he yeah, did. Yeah. And yeah, it was a, it was the end thing. And I always understood some things are in, some things are out. So it's just like, okay, whatever. You know, I'm going to give you grief, but I'm not going to be like, you know, I'm not going to use that to define you one way or the other. You know, we wore skids back in the day. If anybody remembers those plaid, they were like pajamas that were plaid, but you know, you could dance in them and you, you could, you know, <laughs> it, it, you looked cool. So it was just like, that was it. <laughs> no they one sound would. great. Yeah, <laughs> no one's ever pajamas, wearing but also with dancing. Great, right? I, want I mean, all we're saying is Generation X is the best generation, but generations don't matter. That, that's the other. Thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, be be whoever you want to be. It's cool. Just you know, belong to the right group. All right, everybody. <laughs> A bipedal robot, not that cool. You know what is cool, though? An acrobatic robot. Yes, that's where we're going with this. The cool folks at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, or IHMC, are developing a child-sized acrobatic humanoid named Nadia. But they're not the only ones. Researchers at the Biometric Robotics Lab at MIT are also working on a new acrobatic robot. MIT's next-gen Mini Cheetah robots, are, they're different, but they look like the Mini Cheetahs uh, that have been around for a while, were developed with funding and support from Naver Labs and are exploring what the researchers describe as a new humanoid robot design, an actuator-aware kinodynamic motion planner and a landing controller as part of a practical system designed for highly dynamic motion control of the humanoid robot. So think robots that can perform backflips and perform backflips on surfaces that aren't just the ground. You know, it's kind of layers upon layers of agility that actually gets acrobatic and legs that have newly designed actuators with higher power and better torque density. Now, this is all being tested in simulation, and some people say, yeah, well, simulation, I mean, that's not real-world stuff. But MIT says it's modeling the detailed physical constraints that the robots are operating under as it performs dynamic motion. So eventual real-world motions are going to match the simulation as accurately as possible. Oh, my God. Hey, Mr. Robot, do a backflip and then go get the groceries from the store. It's always yeah. super cool until these robots yeah. start glowing red and they start forgetting their uh, their three three laws. Yeah, then then uh, then what? I I love this. Uh, I I think uh, even though it's just a simulation, there's there's some important work being done here because it's it's able to do what big dog and all of those other scary red-eyed glowing robots do uh but but in a different way in a more in a more efficient way and that uh if they can get a prototype working this summer which they think they should be able to i think it's gonna be a huge advance yeah i always worry you know the the dual you out the dual use cases for these things so i don't want to i'm not going to drag the show down so it sounds cool <laughs> and if you know, if the opportunity was there, you could How get. How do we a, know you aren't a robot, Chris? And you're just saying see, that to throw us off the suspicion. Well, I'm the older version model, so there's no <laughs> backflips going do a back on here. <laughs> I just, I always think of these in. I, I understand that yes, you can get all sci-fi movie and and think of worst case, but I just think of, I don't know, a robot that can like, you know, rocket off a building after saving somebody and like do a flip and. I don't know, <laughs> land. It just seems so cool. It's the like... practicalities are, are are much more important than that, but that's the cool part, right? That's what you want to see. <laughs> I feel like I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, so Spider-Man, but a robot. Yay. Yeah. I love yeah, it. Absolutely. <laughs> but the, uh, you have, yeah, well, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, so um, I never saw myself using like a grocery service to deliver groceries to the house. But, oh, you know, during the pandemic, you know, I, I partook a little bit. I, you know, I got a little taste, a little tasty taste. And, uh, yeah, it's actually pretty cool. I'm doing work, and I, I don't feel like running to the store. Hey, babe, well, we need some chickens here so I can smoke them. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> I could definitely see, like, oh, send a robot yeah. to the, to the yeah, grocery yeah. store. 
Robots, what can't they do? Uh, they can't at least, well, no, I guess they can send us emails. Uh, we prefer the human emails, but listen, you know, if you're a robot out there and you're like, oh man, I had a great something to send you, you're included as well. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send your deepest, darkest thoughts or just about something that we talked about on the show. Questions, comments, it's all welcome. We also like to shout out patrons that are master and grandmaster levels. Today they include Tony Glass, Philip Less, and Daniel Dorado. Also, thanks to two of our brand Brand new bosses, Crystal and Bustrod, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Bustrod. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Smart, smart people. They're two of my favorite people right there, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, also, thanks to Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. What have you drawn for us this week, Len? Well, I got to say, I'm in the same group as you guys. I'm in Generation X. And so I had I readily admit that I may have gotten my my oldness may have gotten a little bit of this confused, but this is my version of the fight of the generation, generation millennial versus generation Z. Uh, the uh, matchup is uh, of course the millennial middle parter Megan B versus the baby face generation Z, and uh, they're both kind of squaring off with each other in a ring here. Uh, I'm just going to sit here actually in the background and, and eat popcorn and read Douglas Copeland. That's what I'm going to be doing. So uh, <laughs> I will um, point it, out that the, the side part is the millennial thing. The yes, middle part I know. Is the middle that, part is Gen Z. <laughs> With that, that, that is why I am showing my Generation X vibe. I just don't care, right? It's like you can <laughs> yeah. fight over parts all you want. It's not going to be anything important to me. Anyway, uh, this was actually drawn on a Twitch stream live at twitch.tv uh, forward slash Len Peralta with the help of Biocone 9 of 12, Gomac, Keppers 07, and KT Data. You can also pick this up over at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, and also at my online store, lenperaltastore.com. So get off my lawn. And go and get this print. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Len. Also, thanks to Chris Ashley for being on the show. SMR Podcast is all fired up in my podcatcher because I'm going on a walk after after this. What else is going on with you? Ah, uh, you know, I got, I got. I've been actively practicing smoking chicken. I'm gonna start posting some of those pictures. Uh, I, you know, even though I've smoked chicken for years, uh, I'm trying to get proficient at the barbecue chicken. So if you want to check me out, check me out on. Uh, on Twitter at Big Chris Ashley, but always check out me and the homies on smrpodcast.com. You will not be disappointed. You really won't. Uh, hopefully, you won't be disappointed joining us live Monday through Friday at 4 30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC every weekday, folks. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be back on Monday with Jen Cutter. Have a great weekend. Talk to you soon. Daily Tech News Show is brought to you by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt, although he was barely on this week. I don't know if he deserves a credit. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Straffolino. Video producer, Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Associate producer Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottus One, BioCal, Captain Kipper, and Jack Shid. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Creative Ast Arts. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Chris Ashley. Guests on this week's show included Terrence Gaines, Nika Monford, and Trisha Hirschberger. Live art performed by Len Peralta. And thanks to all the patrons who make this show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>